One of the, the greatest experiences I have as a priest is going to people's deathbeds and giving them the last sacraments, you know. And um, I've had, I have so much optimism as a priest when I, um, when I talk to parents whose children have been far away from the faith and it seems like there's no hope. I'm totally optimistic because I see what happens. I, I go to someone's deathbed and the story is so often the same. You know, I haven't been to church in 40 years. I haven't been to church in 30 years. Or I, I stopped practicing the faith when I was a teenager. And then there's that little call in their heart. And as they get close to death, suddenly this grace of conversion comes, you know. And so, so many times, people who look like they were completely beyond the conversion, they convert. They convert. Now, I'm going to tell you a really amazing story, okay? So, <clears throat> when I was growing up, there was a, a, a girl about my age. Her name was Cynthia. And Cynthia was a convert to the Catholic faith. She was good friends with this big, huge Catholic family. I knew the Grimm family, and so we had common friends. And it turns out that Cynthia um, had a grandmother. Her, her uh, mother had passed away, um, and her dad was nowhere to be found, and so she was living with her grandmother. And her grandmother was very anti-Catholic, you know. And Cynthia had been a convert to the faith when she was a teenager, largely through this Grimm family. Well, after I joined the Abbey, I was a seminarian. Cynthia came and brought, she was married then after that. She brought one of her sons to our summer camp, St. Michael's summer camp there. And, um, and she said to me, you know, my grandmother's just turned 100 and her, her health is really failing. And I was hoping you'd come and talk to her about the Catholic faith. She really wanted her grandmother to be Catholic, you know. So I asked my superior and he gave me permission and I drove up to Pasadena and, uh, and I came in and sat down with her. And before I was able to talk to her grandmother, Cynthia said, she's been having this recurring dream that she's invited to this party, but she can't go. I said, okay, all right. So I sit down, I said, hi, how are you? And do you remember me? She says, yes, I remember you. And we started to talk for a little bit, and I said, tell me about your dream. So she told me about this dream. She's invited to this party. She can't go for some reason. It keeps happening. So I said to her, that dream means that you're invited to go to heaven and the Catholic Church, but you can't go because you're not baptized yet. Do you want to be baptized? And she just says, that would be nice. And that was it. So <laughs> and her, grandmother, her granddaughter, Cynthia, was just like staring with wide eyes. Like Sometimes you just have to be really direct. Well, here's what I find out. So a priest from the Abbey comes up um, a couple days later, baptizes, confirms her, you know. She goes to, um, to Mass once, receives communion once, and dies. And that, that's the end of her life. A hundred years old, she finally becomes the Catholic, okay? Well, when she was being baptized, she says, my mother would be so happy. And my friend Cynthia says, but Grandma, you've been anti-Catholic your whole life. Why would your mother be happy? She said, I know I never told you. My mother was a Catholic. But my father was an atheist and he forbade her from practicing the faith and for passing on the faith to us. So that woman who had been dead for maybe 40 years, her daughter ends up entering the faith as a hundred-year-old woman, you know? And then the story doesn't end there because not only was that woman, uh, that Cynthia's grandmother converted there at a hundred years old, well, Cynthia's mother was baptized on her deathbed. And then Cynthia converted and became a Catholic. And then Cynthia had this brother. And, and I was now a priest, and, and I, I came to visit my friends, the Grimms. And as I walk in the door, uh, Irene Grimm, she says to me, well, isn't that strange? I just got off the phone with Cynthia's brother, and he says he wants to talk to you. And um, I just walked in. I hadn't seen them in months, you know. I just, just literally, I walked in right after a phone call. I said, well, give me his number. So I call him, he says, Look, Father Sebastian, I need you to come and talk to me. I'm in the hospital right now. So I go to the hospital, you know. And he says, look, I haven't lived a good life, but I want to die a Catholic, okay? And I said, you believe everything? 100%. And so I said, okay, I can bat He says, I have surgery tomorrow. I might not survive from the surgery. I said, I can baptize you right now, and I can go to and give you communion and confirm you all because you're about to be, you know, go under surgery like that. So I did it all like that. And he says, I want a Latin mass for my funeral too. You know, that he is so funny, you know. And and uh, he survived the surgery but never recovered really. So he never was able to get out of bed and go to mass. But he, I got him a catechism. He read through it and brought him communion. He died on the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. Huh? September 15th, I remember I was there at his, his deathbed. And, um, and you know, 
every single one of that woman who was married to the atheist, every single one of her descendants became a Catholic before they died. Isn't that amazing? So when I hear about these poor, forlorn Catholic mothers who they, they're so worried and anxious about their children, their grandchildren, I tell them, just look, I've got some inside information here for you. It's going to turn out okay. You pray, you cry, you do everything you need to do. God's going to listen to you and he's going to hear your prayers. When we pray the rosary, those are the, the two moments we ask Our Lady to pray for us, is now and the hour of our death. Those are pretty much the two defining moments in everyone's life. The present is the only time you have and then the one moment you want Our Lady to be praying for you is especially the hour of our death. Huh? Um, think of all the different rosaries and all the different Hail Marys that were said over the course of a Catholic's life and a Catholic mother and all those. Pray for us now and at the hour of our death. Um, that is a moment of supreme importance and that's when Our Lady is most present to every soul, literally at the hour of their death. And um, St. Faustina talks about the, the miracles of divine mercy that happen even when it seems like, you know, there's no hope from an outward perspective, you know. And it must be very frustrating to Satan, I have to say. Uh, I'm glad. I'm, I hope he's as frustrated as he can possibly be. And and I remember there was a story that uh, I think it was maybe St. Louis de Montfort told. He was doing an exorcism and a demon was, was saying in frustration, he says, it's not fair. The rules are different for the ones who say the rosary. They normally would be damned and then they all get saved. <laughs> That's why you say the rosary and like Our Ladies, you could say that. You ask Our Lady over and over again, pray for me at the hour of my death. There's no way she can fail you. She loves you more than your human mother, just like God loves you more than your human father. And um, yeah, the rosary is just the, the greatest prayer we can say for the conversion of ourselves and for others.